Hello, everybody. Can everyone in chat hear me okay? Just let me know um, if everybody can hear what I'm saying, can see me. In chat, we're doing okay. Perfect. So I'm coming through clear. Okay, perfect. Well, then we will get started. Fantastic. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Atomic Testing Museum's Distinguished Lecture featuring Mark Adams of the Truman Library and Museum. My name is Joseph Kent, and I am the Director of Education here at the museum. This evening, Mr. And, Mr. Adams and I will be having a conversation exploring President Truman's decision to drop, uh, to use nuclear weapons against Japan during World War II. Um, on behalf of the NATM staff and our Board of Trustees, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us this evening and for your continued support. Mark Adams has been the Education Director of the Truman Library and Museum for 23 years. He previously worked in the education department at the Kansas Museum uh, of History in Topeka, Kansas, and prior to that taught high school history in Liverpool, England. Mr. Adams has degrees in history and secondary education from the universities of Liverpool and Wolverhampton. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Mark Adams. Thanks, Joseph. Good evening, everybody. So we are going to be having our conversation. I have a list of questions. Um, so Mark, first things first, when did Truman learn about the existence of the Manhattan Project itself? Can you tell us a little bit about what prompted him to kind of be looped in on that? Yeah, it's kind of interesting to go back because you would think, you know, in the inauguration of 1945, when he becomes vice president after the 1944 election, as vice president, he actually didn't know about um, the Manhattan Project. And so the entirety of his 82 days as vice president, he actually doesn't know about the atomic bomb. Interestingly, as a senator, he kind of came close to finding out he was in charge of the Truman Committee that investigated wasteful spending in World War II. And that committee that he was the chair of did come across this $2 billion project but the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, kind of stayed him away from it and said, that's top secret, leave it alone. Well, when he became president on April 12, 1945, after FDR's death, Stimson pulled him to one side and said, I need to tell you about this project in some detail uh, when you have time. And of course, he'd just been inaugurated. That wasn't the time to go into detail. And I'm going to share with you this letter that Secretary of War Stimson um, sends to President Truman shortly after he's become the president. And uh, let me just pull this up so you can see it. Let me go back, sneak preview there to the next one. Um, but this is dated April 24th, 1945. And as you can see, it's from the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, who he'd inherited from FDR's administration. And this is a really important letter because he's writing to Truman about the Manhattan Project. He doesn't use that word in the letter, but we use our inferences. And this is one of the many documents that we have at the Truman Library. We have um, 16 million documents in our collection. This is one page of one document. And this letter, April 24th, and he says that he wants to talk to him about this highly secret matter. And it says in the second paragraph, has such a bearing in our present foreign relations as an important effect on thinking in this field that you ought to know about it much further without much further delay. Now, what I like about this letter though, is at the bottom, Harry Truman's handwriting is on there. Uh, and I'll decipher that for you. It's the handwritten scroll in the bottom right corner, Matt put on list tomorrow, Wednesday, the 25th HST. Matt is Matthew Connolly, his appointment secretary. And he, he puts him on the calendar to meet the next day. And that next day is when Stimson shares all of those details about the Manhattan Project um, to President Truman and gets him, gets him up to speed, so to speak, about the project. So it's not until two weeks after he's president that he really gets the full detail of what is going on with the Manhattan Project in particular. That's, that's great. And it's wonderful to actually see stuff from your collections, the archives that you have. 
Um, so we appreciate you sharing that with us. It's interesting to hear that he was investigating all of the different overspending and came across that it's uh, kind of, I, I didn't know that part. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, that's kind of where he makes his name. I mean, I think it really helps when it comes to the 44 convention that he's kind of been on the front of national magazines because of the hearings and, you know, he's been a senator for 10 years at that point. So he's really beginning to be more known on the national stage. Yeah, fantastic. That's pretty, pretty insightful stuff. Um, now, what were Truman's initial thoughts about the Manhattan, the Manhattan Project once he heard from Stimson, learned about the project itself? What was his initial response and, and what was his reaction to the eventual Trinity test? I think, you know, it, one of the things that Truman writes a lot about in his memoirs and different things, he wanted to carry on the legacy of FDR and he wanted to end the war as quickly as possible and to save American lives. And I think he saw that this was going to allow that. So certainly when he's found out about it, he's, you know, he's excited, but he, you know, he's waiting, right? I mean, the tests don't, the successful test isn't until July. So there's certainly some time. So there's two phases to his reaction, I would say. In end of April, when he has this meeting on April 25th, um, he forms a committee to kind of give him recommendations about how it should be used and where it should be used. This interim committee uh, starts meeting in June and they, they make recommendations to him. But it's really that successful test in July, um, when he um, really then can consider its use. And he's really, really excited about that um, in that he can accomplish his goals of ending the war as quickly as possible and to save American lives, which FDR had the same policy. So I think it's a level of excitement, the fact that they can, you know, maybe possibly end the war um, as quickly as they can. Now you're talking about Stimson um, and you know he's one of many advisors for, for Truman, of course. Could you get into a little bit about the other advisors that Truman would be speaking with about what to, to do with the atomic bomb? Um, right. You can kind yeah. of add to that. Stimson is, Stimson is certainly key. He's the Secretary of War. You know, he's the one that's kind of the liaison to the Manhattan Project through General Groves. Um, but then he also obviously has the key people in the different branches of, of the armed services, such as Lee, Lehigh and Nimitz and, and others. Um, and then his own Secretary of State changes. Um, so uh, Burns comes in and um, really becomes Truman's closest confidant. And I think I've got one letter. We're going to use it twice tonight because it does... Um, show some of the advisors in a letter. Um, I'm gonna actually jump ahead um, to this and then come back later on. Um, let me show you a couple of different things here. This is the what to get to get the first part of your question. This is when he writes in his diary about the, the test itself. Now remember some, just some background here. Truman is actually in Germany when the test takes place. He's at the Potsdam conference meeting with Stalin and Churchill. And this is a diary entry from that, but obviously Truman's writing is small and it's hard to read. And I've pulled out the text to the right here and you can read that. He's talking about the 13 pounds of explosives ca causing a crater 600 feet wide and 1200 feet in diameter. And it's knocked a tower over and all of these things. But even in this diary entry of July 25th, he's already decided. He says, this weapon is to be used against Japan between now and August 10th. So that's part of it, and it's gonna be used. I mean, they, they just found out about it, but there's no, there's no delay. They wanna use it as quickly as possible. And then to the other point that you mentioned about his advisors, in this letter from 1946, um, he talks about the people he's referring to in the second paragraph, talking about the Secretary of State, which is Burns, Secretary of War, Stimson, Secretary of Navy, Lehigh, General Staff of the Allied Armies, as well as, and even the British uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Churchill, and then Attlee, just as an aside there, the reason he mentions 
Atley is that Churchill actually loses the British election during the Potsdam Conference. And so those are the people, he tells Churchill about it at Potsdam. And he tells one other person at Potsdam, although not in great detail, he actually tells Joseph Stalin that he has this new weapon. So they're not advisors. Stalin certainly isn't an advisor, but he certainly, he tells him about it. It's a pretty closely guarded secret, um, you know, in the administration, but he's got those um, different cabinet members, um, really leans on Stimson, really leans on Burns for the closest advice, um, but certainly the Navy are involved. They're gonna have to get the weapon in place to be used, you know, and, and, and then he does tell Churchill about it and uh, then mentions it as, as an aside to, to Stalin as well, which is pretty fascinating. Of course, as we find out in the 50s and 60s, Stalin had spies there and, and knew all about it anyway, but Truman wasn't to know that. Well, see, that's the part that I, I find, um, you know, really, really curious because, I, you know, oftentimes we'll hear people talk about how, how you know, part of the reason why we, we use the, the nuclear weapons on Japan was as an act of, you know, puffing out our chest against the Soviet Union, Russia, and, you know, kind of intimidation factor. But they already knew about it before, you know, he already talked to Stalin, so it wasn't this closely guarded secret in the sense of... Yeah, and I don't want to get the wrong impression. He doesn't go into a great amount of detail with mm -hmm. Stalin, but he tells him he's got this new weapon and, and Stalin basically shrugs and mm -hmm. encourages him to use it. Uh, actually, the, one of the things that Truman wanted out of the Potsdam Conference is that he wanted the Soviets to come in against Japan. He gets that agreement from Stalin. Um, very, very much in the first 24 hours of the conference. Um, so he's pretty happy about it. He writes home to his wife, Bess, and says, you know, the Russians are coming in. And he, he's really excited about that. Now, you know, some of those theories, I think, have come later in time in the 50s and the 60s. Certainly at the time, there was no um, thought about using this um, to puff out the chests against, against the Soviets. In fact, Stimson, even though Truman disagreed with him, Stimson wanted to share all of that information with the Soviets, um, even post-World War II, uh, once the surrender had taken place in Tokyo Bay. But uh, there was some in the administration that didn't agree with that. So it's interesting you're talking about, you know, agreeing and disagreeing. Uh, the next question is, was there anybody in, you know, the cabinet, um, any advisors to Truman who maybe didn't agree with the decision to use the weapons against Japan? Was there anybody who were, I guess, dissenting opinions amongst them? Not within his closest advisors. Like I mentioned, they had this interim committee that, that gave recommendations. There really wasn't any consideration of that. Um, and going back to FDR, I mean, FDR died in April. FDR asked if they could use the atomic bomb during the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, in Germany, so against Germany. So there was certainly not much consideration of not using the bomb. There were certainly other options, but I don't think that they were either or. I think like the land invasion, it was in addition to dropping of the bomb. It wasn't in, in place of. So all of those things would be combined, blockading, things like that, all would be to end the war as quickly as possible and to save lives. Those were the two prime considerations. There's been some discussion, there was some discussion with the interim committee about testing it and, and demonstrating it to the Japanese uh, in the interim committee. It was quickly dismissed because one of the things that came up was that they thought the Japanese would move American prisoners of war to that island if it was on an uninhabited island. And then how would you get that information back to the Japanese? Uh, one of the things that people have to recognize is that the Americans at that point had infiltrated the Japanese uh, communications networks and were monitoring hundreds of thousands of messages a month 
Um, and so they kind of had a sense of uh, what the Japanese plans were and what the devotion was and how they were really unwilling to surrender. Um, now that was a little confusing because you had both um, domestic civilian communication and you also had military and they didn't necessarily always agree um, with one another. So they had to do a lot of deciphering literally of the codes, but also of what was, which was the, which, which messages counted the most. And some of that led to um, some hesitation about the land invasion um, that I think we're going to talk about in a few minutes, but some of that, um, some of that top secret intelligence kind of informed them some more about those other options and it helped them really form the solution that they wanted to drop the atomic bomb because of that intelligence. So it's interesting you talk about that it was never an either or, it was always a, a plan throughout that it was going to be the atomic bombs and then the land invasion itself, if, if that would be necessary. Can you tell us a little bit about um, about that land um, land assault? Uh, what was it called? What would that have entailed? And, and how long did they plan on on engaging in that? Right. So the so the whole operation was Operation Downfall. The first part of that was Operation Olympic, which had been a land invasion uh, in November. Um, and often the, the discussion, the historians and, and the public, um, we see some contradictions in terms of how many casualties and how many deaths that land invasion um, would have been. And some of that's based on you know, previous invasions just shortly before uh, in the spring and the early summer in 1945. Um, and, but what the thing I was re referencing to before with the intelligence when they broke those codes and were able to monitor that intelligence. One of the things that they discovered is that the Japanese were moving their defenses to the exact point where the land invasion would have taken place in Operation Olympic. And so instead of an overwhelming majority of American troops making that amphibious landing, the ratio was getting closer and closer to being even on each side, which of course, the Navy and the, and the Army were not going to actually support the plan if, the, if it was a one-to-one -one ratio on either side of Americans and Japanese forces, because that would really increase the casualties. So the casualties figures debate. You see lots of different estimates about that, um, you know, from 250,000 up to a million. And Truman even uses different numbers himself, and he's been criticized for that, for kind of using inflated numbers or when Marshall tells him one number and Truman uses another. So that's a little bit difficult to get your head around, but there's certainly no doubt that the Navy were in particular were really worried about this intelligence and that the uh, Japanese were building up exactly where the American troops were going to land. And so that plan, although it was in place for November, was actually still under consideration and, um, you know, who knows, maybe they would have gone ahead. Um, the, when you asked about dissent, uh, there was a little bit of concern in terms of that the atomic bomb would actually not lead to surrender. So it wasn't about not using the bomb. It was, well, we're still going to have to carry on because the bomb wouldn't necessarily lead to surrender, which is an interesting point because even after Nagasaki, even after August 9th, as they waited for the Japanese to surrender if they would or if they wouldn't, they actually resumed bombing on August 13th, you know, of Japanese cities. So Truman ordered, you know, the resumption of the conventional bombing even after the atomic bomb. So it's certainly uh, what surrender wasn't guaranteed and wasn't 100%, um, you know, guaranteed in any form. And so that land invasion plan was part of that a little bit later. Um, as were, you know, possibly more new atomic bombs as they were continuing to be developed. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, I, I think, you know, when we, when we speak to people here at the museum or even through social media, we oftentimes, you know, it, we think of it as, or they think of it as, you know, we, we dropped the, the nuclear weapons, they surrendered, 
and then we went into peacetime, but it was a little bit more complicated than that. It wasn't immediate, and there was additional right. uh, firebombing as well, um, even the days yeah. after Nagasaki. So I think that's an interesting point, absolutely. And the next thing I want to talk about, too, is, you know, we were, we were speaking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and, you know, life after that, but when did they actually settle on the cities themselves. Right. So was it always Hiroshima and Nagasaki or were there other options in between that? Yeah, I'm going to share a document with that in a moment. Let me give you the background of that. that, that again, that interim committee was the one that uh, discussed those various cities. There was a number of different considerations and it's hard to say, <clears throat> excuse me, let me get a glass of water here. It's hard to say exactly which of high priorities, but certainly they wanted cities that um, were known to have military installations or ports, right? And so uh, Hiroshima is a port and Nagasaki has the uh, naval building installation. Another consideration was the, um, if the, uh, quite frankly, if the cities had not been bombed previously because they wanted to see and demonstrate the level of damage so in a way it was a pristine city. I do have one document I'm gonna share with you. I think I may have shared it or looked at it already, but it, it mentions the, um, let me uh, get the slideshow here. Um, I'm gonna get, the, I'm going the wrong direction. I apologize doing this live, you know, it's, uh, that's where they, he's talking about the thing. This is, this is a really interesting document from the National Archives and it's 25th of July. And this is from the commanding general, Spatz, um, or it's to him from, from uh, General Handy, who's, who's stepping in because um, Marshall is at the uh, Potsdam Conference, uh, or Eisenhower. Um, and this is where he, they mention the cities. So he's talking about the, um, the bombing to be out after August 3rd. And then he has Hiroshima, Kokura, Nagata, and Nagasaki. And some people argue that's kind of the, um, the order, uh, you know, the priority. But all of that would be to do with the weather and, you know, if there was any interception by the Japanese and any other things that might affect um, those locations. But those are the four cities listed. We know, of course, it ends up being Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There's a lot of documentation that they did fly over Kokura and those cloud cover and the weather um, did not, was not conducive. And so they changed track to Nagasaki. Um, but this is the 25th of July when this is written. Now, some people have argued, you know, what if the Japanese had surrendered after the Potsdam Declaration? So there is, a, there is some discussion about this document in that um, Truman, could stop this at any time. Um, so these ish, these these orders are in place, but it does give a date, at, you know, after about August 3rd. And so they're ready to go, you know, so they're, they're getting prepared. They've got the bomb group ready. You've got the cities identified. And then it does say, interestingly, additional bombs will be delivered on the above targets as soon as made ready by the project staff. So that's an interesting point because we know now in, in 2020 with all of the research that's been done and, and um, is that the next, and there's a, the do, another document I didn't bring tonight, but there's another document that says that um, Groves would have a third bomb ready by August the 19th and then more available in October, November, December. Um, but at this point they had two live available and they use both but there was the cities they're listed now i do have a question um you know we we get this question a lot as well and you know um you know people ask about why hiroshima why nagasaki would you like to elaborate why those were chosen and, and what was the reason for um Gakura being on the list nagata uh, is there any any reason those were elevated versus others? I, well, I think, you know, some would take, um, one way to look at that is almost in reverse, is, is that uh, there was a city, I believe it's Kyoto, that was on the list originally, 
and Stimson, Secretary of War, spent some time with his wife, the, I believe in the 20s. Some have said it was his honeymoon, I, 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 but certainly they'd gone on vacation there and thought it was a beautiful cultural city. And he, he stepped in and actually got that taken off the list. Um, but certainly the, the military installation was probably the highest priority. That it would, if there was any military um, development taking place, which both of those cities did, and also if they had not been damaged in the past, so that it would demonstrate to the Japanese the full impact of one bomb. So those are the two things that I've read about um, that um, led to their selection, so to speak. And then on the day of or in the week of, then the weather would be the final determining factor because if you have cloud cover, then you wanna make sure it's accurate and you wanna have clear skies and so forth. So that would be the pilot discretion, but using those, that short list and then going from there. Does that help answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I think, yeah, learning a little bit of insight into why they went with the cities they did is helpful for sure. Um, the next question I have, you talked a little bit about how there were more um, weapons in development at the time. Did they have an idea of how many numbers they were going to have by the end of the year? Did they think that they would have to do more than the two of you mentioned? The third was always on the table. Yeah, the third, but, yeah, the 19th. And then um, the v numbers vary a little bit, but um, certainly more by October, November, I think up to 10 or maybe even 12 by the end of the year, but certainly half a dozen by November, um, both plutonium and, and uranium type. So, yeah. And in, and in fact, like I said, FDR wanted to use them in Germany and there was certainly some discussion with the land invasion of maybe using them on the mainland and things like that to help with the land invasion. If, if, if surrender had not taken place. Interesting, yeah, that, that definitely, um, you know, looking at it as in, you know, part of the Ashwa invasion itself is, is, I hadn't considered that, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. They, for what they knew at the time, it made the most logical step. Yeah, and we have to understand, I mean, until one was dropped, they really didn't have a sense of the complete devastation. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, you had very experienced pilots who had dropped hundreds if not thousands of bombs in various raids in Dresden and Tokyo, and they were astonished by the impact of one bomb. So after that, and it's really why Truman takes a presidential control um, back from the military after Nagasaki, after the reports come in from Hiroshima, that's when we go back to presidential control, which is how it is today. It's one of the legacies really of atomic bombs in terms of the president having control rather than the military because of the absolute devastation, which I don't think the scientists, the military really had any sense of the huge impact. And then of course the radiation, which they, I don't think in 1945, they really understood at all. Absolutely. And we've heard stories of scientists kind of, their, their expectations were a little bit all over the place, what they actually thought would happen. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, a lot of them were, like you're saying, just in awe of, you know, Trinity and the subsequent weapons. Um, the next question I'd like to get into is, um, what, were the, what was the aftermath of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki going into the, the discussion of the casualties and maybe perhaps some about the, the, the lasting effect of radiation, if you'd like to get into that a little bit? Right. And obviously, we're all very well aware of the devastating, awful um, amounts of casualties and deaths, and then of course, the radiation. Um, again, these numbers always vary um, combined. You know, you can read up to 250,000 deaths with both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then of course, the radiation uh, afterwards as well, which I don't think uh, many understood. Um, and so those numbers are, are huge, and you know, from one bomb. Um, and then, of course, you know, the longer lasting effects over the decades, um, even to, into the next generation that we really didn't understand. So, and, then, and that's where Truman, um, that's one of the reasons when he gets those initial reports from Hiroshima in particular, he then takes that 
step to say, wait, if you're going to do any more, you have to go through the office of the president. And he was thinking of the future too, not just, not just the, his current administration, but in the future that that decision would remain with the president rather than, you know, with the commander in the field in whatever, whatever theater that you're in at that time. Thank you, Mark. And that also kind of ties into what we talk about here, where um, the, you're talking about the, the legacy of that decision. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission would be established right. and not, you know, in you know, a couple of years later. So that, you know, civilian control um, is the lasting legacy that continues even to, to today. And it, and it happened only a little bit after his decision uh, to make it the president's final say. So I think that's, you know, that's a way how these things are tied together in museums. For sure. Yeah, there's certainly some communication in August, um, before the 19th of August, that says, um, you know, with the, the, with the expectations that this third bomb is going to be ready, but it can't be used without presidential orders. So that evidence exists that it, they that definitely had switched to President Truman rather than, you know, the the, uh, the general on the ground in in the in the, in Asia. Absolutely, yeah. And it was um, I was double checking. Um, 1946. It was actually August, right after uh, the Navy did Operation Crossroads. So it was immediately after that 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 they decided it is going to be civilian control. So uh, certainly could have gone a very different direction had he not made that decision. Right. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about what was the, um, you know, the early response from the American public um, and, you know, allies across the world and what was their initial thought? Well, obviously, I mean, the, with the war, with the, once surrender, um, is announced on, on August 15th. And then of course, uh, sept in September, the, the Tokyo Bay surrender uh, that, you know, we know it now as VJ day and the world celebrated peace really. And so there was over joy and overwhelming relief that this war was over. It, it built to a climax really. And, you know, millions and millions had died across the globe. Um, so certainly the relief and the peace, but then, you know, you're right, there, there's, as more and more of these reports came out, then there was a little bit more of a bit of hindsight. Could we have done it with it? Could we have done it without it? And so it's probably one of the most debated decisions today because of that. Uh, but certainly initially, um, the amount of relief and celebration across the globe uh, when the war was over. And the, really, it's some of the second guessing is, is a little bit later on after more and more of these reports come out, then you wonder about was there a different way. But certainly in Truman's mind and in the administration's mind and the military's mind, there was no other option. Like I said, FDR was, if, was asking if they were ready during the Battle of the Bulge. So there's no doubt that FDR would have used the atomic bomb in the same way. Thank you, Mark. And that kind of makes me wonder how early would you say, I mean, it's hard to, to pinpoint, of course, but what would, what would you say is when we, we, they started hearing, um, you know, when they started questioning their, you know, the reason to, to drop the bomb and whether it was a, a good idea or if it was justified, when did you start, when you start seeing it through the documents you have, when does that start getting into the conversation? Well, he get he gets letters right away. Um, and I've got a few and it really, it's more to show you Truman's response. So let me go to that and then we'll, we'll see more what he has to say about it. Um, this is the order we looked at. And this is a letter that he receives in 1946, or he sends in 1946. And this gentleman has made a film about the atomic bomb, um, but he kind of questions the film already. So this is only a year later. And this film isn't quite what Truman expected. Doesn't really, uh, he just, he objects to the film um, and he says that uh, the use of the bomb was deliberated for long hours because the film apparently said it was more of a snap judgment. And he talks about the people that were involved, which you mentioned earlier. And then he gives them some background. And he says in the end of this third paragraph, 
um, I came to the conclusion that if 250,000 young Americans could be saved, then the bomb should be dropped than it was. So he's kind of giving his justification just a year later. And this is not the first time for sure. Uh, and then I've got another one. Um, this is, um, this is, I mean, this is actually um, right in August. Now this is, this is from Senator Russell from Georgia and it was in favor. And in fact, the Congressman wanted more bombs dropped on Japan, but he's, using the word regret a little bit, he is regretting the necessity of wiping out whole populations. But again, he says the same thing. My object is to save as many lives as possible. But I also have a humane feeling for the women and children in Japan. And this is August 9th, the day of the, Hiro the Nagasaki bombing. So he's certainly thinking of, he's certainly thinking of the humane side of it, which He's going to be accused of not doing that later on. So it's really interesting that he's um, very much having to defend his position or justify his position right from the outset. That's one of the, the main reasons we wanted to have you because here you know, <laughs> to talk to everyone is because we wanted to talk about what it was from Truman's perspective. Oftentimes we look at it as the decision and, and the rationale, but we can look at the, the what they're dealing with. They're making they're struggling as well with the fact that this is going to affect um, civilian populations. So it's not as if that they were cold to the idea. They it's interesting to see it from Truman's perspective behind, you know, on the podium, but talking to people in correspondences. Right, and Truman was a great letter writer. So we're very very lucky. Uh, in our in our archives collection, we have more than one thousand three hundred letters to his wife. Um, some when he, they were dating and most of them when he's married. And then, of course, this correspondence with the general public. So we're very fortunate within those 16 million documents that I mentioned before. We've got some astonishing letters and he's very candid. He was always very candid with people um, as he uh, didn't really waver from his opinion. Well, that actually brings up uh, uh, my next question, which was, did he ever change his view? You were talking about how he, he looked at it as, you know, it was unfortunate that this affected these people, but I stand by my decision. Did he ever waver in that? Did he ever change his opinion yeah. on the decision? I'm going to, again, I'm going to show you a couple of letters because they, I mean, that's the evidence that we have, right? Is what he wrote. And I've got some from the sixties. So it's a little bit later in life. Those of you who don't know, President Truman died in 1972, but we've got some letters from the 1960s where he's having to do that. Um, let me uh, pull those up. It's, this is where we left off. This is the one I showed you already. So let's go to the next one. This is in 1963. Um, and this was a column that was done, columnist in the Chicago Sun-Times. And the what I wanted to point out in this is um, he talks about the number of lives that were saved on the American side. He also talks about the number of saved on the Japanese side, which is interesting. And he talks about half a million being saved. And, you know, that's just on Truman's opinion. Um, but again, it's that last paragraph that I wanted to point out. Uh, I knew what I was doing when I stopped the war that would have killed. And he says, I have no regrets. And under the same circumstances, I would do it again. And this letter is not confidential. Now he's writing to a newspaper. So he knows the newspaper is likely going to publish it. And that's why he wrote that. But he also reminds people in most of his letters and most of his correspondence, he always points back to Pearl Harbor as part of his argument. Um, and so he does mention that. Um, and then the other one I wanted to show you is uh, this one from the following year, 1964. And well, again, he's on the way to Potsdam and, he, and so on. Um, but he says again, um, it ended the war. Um, there's nothing to take home with you to sleep with. It was a means to end the war and to save. Again, he uses the word number 250,000 from being killed on our side and that many on the Japanese side. These numbers vary in different, in different documents. 
and he's telling people refer to my memoirs after after he retired from the presidency and he um, had the Truman Library opened in 1957. Uh, he, and he worked in the Truman Library until his, till later in, for the next 12 years, really. Uh, he wrote his memoirs and put a lot of that information in there. But he says, I was never worried about the dropping of the bomb. It was just a means to end the war. And that is what was accomplished. So that's in 1964. So that, you know, do the math. That's almost 20 years, it's August, right? It's almost 20, 19 years afterwards, if I got the math right. <laughs> and it's just, it's just eight years before he dies in, in December of 1972. So it's one of the later letters where he is um, justifying, I guess is the right word, justifying his decision. So he really doesn't waver. He does use the word regret a couple of times in terms of he regrets the loss of life and he regrets the loss of women and children. But he says, I've had to make the same decision. I would have done the same thing in the same circumstances. Absolutely. And, it, and it's amazing that, you know, 20 years after, he still, he still, you know, has that conviction of it was the right call, despite all of the having to constantly answer those questions. He, he stuck to it um, in terms of his view. He, do, he actually doesn't think it's even the most difficult decision that he made as president. His most difficult decision in his words, in his memoirs, is he uh, is putting men troops on the ground in the Korean War. People might not realize Truman was a soldier in World War One. He was a captain. He was the only president to serve in combat in World War One, And he really wrestled with putting troops on the ground. And so he describes his most difficult decision was putting troops on the ground in the Korean War in 1950. And that's interesting, you know, how we look at it now um, to, to learn of that is, is you know, it, it makes a lot of sense from a, a soldier's perspective, you know, making the call to put them boots on the ground and put them in the, the line of fire like that would be a tough decision to make. Yeah, there... he, he, he fought in that Mus Argonne offensive in 1918, and that was a brutal offensive, and he saw the devastation of World War I. Very different scale than the atomic bomb, of course, but he saw men on the ground you know, in France being killed. And that was very much in his mind with the Korean War. And I'm sure it played a role. I mean, you might be able to, to add to this, um, but it probably played a role in his decision with the atomic bomb as well, knowing that it, you know, the, the likelihood of a land invasion was still very exactly. much. Exactly. It's got it. You've got to think it was weighed in his mind um, because he often, you know, was cautious about, well, again, it's that same tenant. He wanted to win the war as quickly as possible to save American lives. And that land invasion certainly would have led to lots of casualties and deaths that he was trying to avoid, for sure. Absolutely. And, and before we, we open up to questions, um, I did have a couple more things. Um, we were talking about how Truman felt. Um, now, after his passing, um, did his family um, face some of that? Did they, did they speak out and in defense of him, what kind of things did his family have to deal with after? I'm just curious, being you know at the library and museum and you're dealing with the family, what kind of experiences did they have after he passed? Yeah, his 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 only he just had one daughter. Of course, his his wife outlived him another ten years. Uh, for your trivia fans, um, Bess Truman was the longest living first lady and still holds that record. Um, I think um, Mrs. Carter is going to catch her next year, if I got the math right. But she lived until 1982, and she's buried next to President Truman in our courtyard at the library. Um, I'm giving you a very long-winded answer. Um, Margaret Truman is their only daughter. She passed in 2008, and she's interred. Her, her ashes are actually in our courtyard as well, along with her husband, which means the oldest relative of President Truman is Clifton Truman Daniel, his oldest grandson. He has four, uh, three living. Uh, Clifton is really the spokesperson in terms of the family. He's visited Japan and he's done a lot of peace and reconciliation efforts um, in, uh, with Japan. And, um, and so he doesn't necessarily defend his grandfather or uh, oppose him either. He just very much uh, works towards peace and reconciliation with Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Japan in general. And I will show you an, an artifact relating to that a little bit later on when we talk about the museum itself. 
Well, it's great to hear, you know, it's, you know, looking at building those bridges and healing those wounds, uh, regardless of, you know, how you view it, it's still a worthwhile um, thing to pursue that piece. Um, and yeah, he's, he's met with um, survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and has done uh, all histories with them and communicated with them. And um, it's, I think it's meant a lot to the Japanese people. Um, and I think it's meant a lot to him too, personally. Well, absolutely growing up and, and, you know, being in, in, you know, in that family and, you know, hearing that and, and wanting to, to go that route is really inspiring um, to, to, like I said, you know, build those bridges. And it's also interesting to mention that, you know, Japan, and the United States have since um, World War II have had a strong relationship and actually been strong allies um, throughout that. So it's, you know, that's very reflective of that, I, I think. Um, my next question is, it's, I've heard that there's a remodel, uh, going, a remodeling going on at the, uh, Truman Library and Museum. Would you like to talk a little bit about that and what people can expect when you reopen? Yeah. So we closed, um, the summer of, la of 2019, we closed last year for renovation of our museum. And, and really it's probably the largest, uh, museum renovation that Truman Library has done since it uh, opened in 1957 which President Truman raised the money for and got the original building uh, up to speed. I wanna, uh, so the, the museum renovation should be completed um, by the end of uh, October, early November. Whether we can reopen at that point is another matter because of the pandemic, of course. But this 25 to $30 million renovation is gonna completely transform the exhibits. What you see behind me on my green screen is uh, our Oval Office exhibit, which will be reinstalled, that will be remaining, as will the Truman grave sites, of course, and the office that Truman works in, worked in when he was here. Those three features will remain, as will our Thomas Hart Benton mural independence of the opening of the West. But the rest of the entire museum, both floors, um, first and second floor of the exhibits are being completely redone right now. And uh, I'm excited to show you a couple of things related to our topic tonight, obviously not the whole exhibit, but a couple of artifacts, one we've mentioned briefly uh, relating to Clifton Truman Daniel. So let me get the screen back up to show you those again. And uh, we'll, we'll move forward from these. This is uh, an item that we're gonna have on display. This is a safety plug from the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. And I'll show you this tag close up in a moment but this green safety plug would have been removed before the live plug was put in for the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, uh, on Nagasaki, excuse me. And that this was donated to us by Philip Barnes, whose name is on this tag. Um, and this is from Frederick Ash Ashworth and Philip Barnes. Um, they certify on this from the 10th of August, 1945, that this is one of the two green safety plugs used on the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki and um, Philip Bombs came to the library in the 1990s and donated that uh, to our museum curator. And so we're excited to have that featured in our new exhibit, but juxtaposed near it in the same gallery is this item. And this is um, a paper crane made by Sak Sadako Sasaki, who, uh, whose family donated it to Clifton Truman Daniel. Um, Clifton Truman Daniel was visiting uh, the 9-11 memorial for an anniversary ceremony around 2010, I believe. And uh, one of the Sasaki's relatives gave this to Clifton Truman Daniel and said it was one of the very last that she had folded. And if you're not familiar with the story of the thousand paper cranes, uh, she folded 1300 in her lifetime before she succumbed to radiation she was a survivor of the Hiroshima bombing, but it was part of the, it really started those um, efforts between Clifton Truman Daniel and um, survivor population from Japan. And it was given to the Truman Library and we're gonna have this on display, um, actually surrounded by 600 paper cranes made by Kansas City children in 2020 um, surrounding this in the display in the same room, we're gonna have the safety plug and this crane uh, juxtaposed 
against one another to help interpret um, Truman's decision to drop the atomic bomb and of course the aftermath of that. So we're excited to have those items as part of our museum renovation when hopefully we'll reopen towards the end of the year, uh, depending of course on the pandemic situation. So those are some pretty exciting items that we're, we're gonna be having on display. But the, the exhibits itself will actually cover Truman's entire life from, from birth all the way through his presidency, uh, all the way through post um, his legacy after presidency as well. well. I know you and I have talked that my plan is to, when we can, obviously when you reopen, come out and visit you and, and take a look at the um, all the exciting new artifacts, all of the, the new features that you're going to have. Um, I did have a question too. Um, are there resources that those in um, that are attending um, that can go to your websites and, and, and the resources they, if they want to learn more about? In, uh, in, I don't know if you realize that maybe you've seen it in my email signature. In addition to being the education director, I'm also the webmaster for the library. So it behooves me to promote our website, trumanlibrary.gov. We are part of the National Archives and Records Administration, one of the 14 presidential libraries in the country, but our, our website is trumanlibrary.gov. And then if you're really interested in the documents, you can click on the library section, look at our online document section. We actually have a special section on Truman's decision to chop the atomic bomb, including that 14 page report by General Groves um, from Los Alamos talking about the very first atomics uh, explosion test that 14 page document is part of that online document collection. Then we have about between 50 and 60,000 photographs online. And I would also like to promote our, the Truman Library's YouTube channel, which has a number of incredible digitized videos, newsreels, Truman speeches and so forth. So we have a really robust um, online documents, online photographs, YouTubes, and then for teachers as the education director, we also have more than 400 lesson plans online that teachers can use and download and, and uh, on various topics, not of course, just about the atomic bomb, but on many aspects of Truman's life and presidency as well. So trumanlibrary.gov and then search away. Thank you, Mark. And, and it's, it's always nice, I'm sure, to, to get into stuff that isn't about the bomb. I'm sure that's a, a relief to <laughs> or other aspects of his presidency. Um, I think we're, if you're good, I think we can open up for any questions in chat. Uh, you can use either the chat feature or the Q&A feature at the bottom of uh, your screen. So we can open that now. And um, I think we uh, mark about 10 minutes. I think we'll- Whatever, we'll... whatever you need, I'm here. All right, fantastic. So whenever everybody's ready, And if you've got more while we're waiting for people to type, you go go right ahead. Put me on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> well, you definitely answered a lot of the, the questions <laughs> as you were going. There were some that, that popped up about his family and things like that that I hadn't considered before. Is that you know what were they doing after you know he, he passed? Because um, certainly you're you know you're related to to a president. You're going to to deal with a lot of this. Yeah, stuff. Clifton. Clifton was about 15 when his grandfather died. And he, he says that he didn't even really talk to his grandfather about it. It wasn't until afterwards, really when his own children, Truman's great grandchildren, went to high school and started learning about it, that they, they come home with information. In fact, his grandson is the one that came home with, uh, let's see, Tr Clifton's son. So uh, Truman's great grandson, uh, I think it was Wesley, um, came home with a thousand paper crane book, which got, um, Clifton Truman Daniel um, was not aware of that until his own son brought that home from school. Um, so it's interesting, his avenue into that story. Um, and that's one I would recommend for teachers to use to kind of teach that side of it. It's a really uh, very well done and, and uh, very moving and gives you a sense of the idea of peace and, and uh, reconciliation is a good, good lesson for students, of course. So yeah, so his approach, he wasn't like he had conversations with his grandfather about it, but um, he says he wishes he did, but I don't think he would have, you know, I'm not sure that President Truman would have necessarily wanted to discuss it with his grandchild. I don't know. Yeah. Um, speaking of um, 
uh, the museum and library, you're talking about the artifact. Is there um, an existing artifact that you have uh, that is, is special to you or one that sticks out for you as, as a personal favorite? Um, I know you've been there, like you talked about in the introduction. For yeah, years, so. there's a few, but the, one of the ones I like to use with students because it gets such a great reaction. We have a, an original painting by Norman Rockwell, um, which is, um, and you can probably do a Google search for it. It's called Family Squabble, um, but we have an original by Norman Rockwell in our collection, and we'll be, and it's around the 1948 election, so it shows a, um, a husband and wife arguing across the breakfast table, and the husband has a newspaper with Dewey, and the wife has the newspaper with. Harry Truman and they're arguing over the table and there's a ne neglected child crying under the table and there's a, uh, a cat and a dog looking at this argument and it kind of shows how the nation was split uh, for the 48 election. So that's probably off the top of my head, one of my favorite artifacts. I think some of the new things we've got, which we've never displayed before, we inherited some material from a Korean War Museum in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, in, in numerous uh, uniforms from the Korean War and artifacts from the Korean War that we've not been able to display before. And with our new museum renovation, we're gonna be able to display those. So uh, those are new and exciting artifacts, uh, including you know, walkie talkies to show communication and technology and photographs of helicopters that were so important in uh, medical treatment during the Korean War and triage mats and stretchers and surgeon lamps and things. And mostly what we've had before related to the Korean War has been, you know, the government documents. That's what we're about. We're a government institution. We have the government side, but we really haven't had the personal side, uniforms and personal photographs and artifacts relating to individual people who fought in the war. And now we have that. So that's exciting as well. Thank you, Mark. Um... It's always fun to hear what people uh, kind of gravitate towards. Um, so um, I'm reminding everyone in chat, we are open for questions. Um, and um, one of the questions I did have is you were mentioning about how you have lesson plans for teachers and all sorts of topics. Um, what are some of the topics that, that tend to be popular with, with teachers um, in case there's anybody who's going to be yeah, watching? That that's a good be question. Does it off the top of my head, I would have to go back and look, but off the top of my head, uh, there's been a real push about civil rights and Truman integrated the military with an executive order, 9981 in 1948. And then, um, and so teachers who often teach civil rights in the 1960s are unaware of the fact that the, the military is integrated in 1948. They're aware maybe of Jackie Robinson, which is in 1947 and Major League Baseball but the military is uh, through executive order is integrated in 1948. Now it, it takes a while, it doesn't happen right away, but during the Korean war that I mentioned, integration slowly takes place. And by the end of the Korean war in 1953, 98% of the troops are integrated. So it's that first wave of civil rights. So teachers like to look at that because it's post-World War II and it's before the sixties. The other probably is the cold war in general and then as a case study, probably the Berlin Airlift because of all the logistics around it and the story of Gail Harvest and the candy bomber. And, you know, those more hum the humanitarian effort that was undertaken to help the city of Berlin survive and to stop Stalin and Berlin at, without going to war um, is another one that teachers gravitate towards because it's kind of that first blows of the Cold War, which is on most high school curriculum nowadays. So those, are, and then of course, I already mentioned the Korean War. So those, those come up in terms of his early life, certainly World War I and Truman's, Truman's time as, as, a, as a captain in France uh, comes up with his, his early career. So those are the ones that teachers tend to gravitate towards in terms of, of lesson plans. Sometimes they might look at the government classes and constitution, and they may be looking at uh, Truman and the steel, seizing the steel mills as an example of a president um, taking too much power and the Supreme Court stops him. So when you've got a government class looking at the balance of power, uh, they often will do that. Um, so those are the ones. And then more recently in the last decade, 
We've had more examination of Truman's recognition of Israel. He's the first world leader to recognize Israel. Also in 1948, the same year as the Berlin Airlift and the same year as the election and same year as um, the desegregation of the military. So 1948 is a big year. And so some teachers looking at the Middle East and, and the creation of Israel, look at Truman's role in recognizing Israel in May of 1948. So those are the ones off the top of my head. And we have lots of lesson plans about all of those topics that teachers and students can look at. And, and speaking of, um, you know, content and things like that, that they're able to access. Um, is there any plan for, I know obviously you're doing the renovation. Is there any plan for um, more virtual content as, as schools, some schools are uh, doing virtual only? Is there, is there a plan to accommodate some of that? We've actually been doing a lot of those. Uh, we've been doing webinars with a group called the Presidential Primary Sources Project uh, since the spring. And we've been doing them anyway since 2012, but more like once a year back then. Now with the pandemic, we've been doing those far more frequently. So we've probably done four or five of those since March on the four-day election. We've done one on the atomic bomb. Uh, we're doing one on presidential power in the steel crisis here in September with other presidential libraries actually. And then uh, we just recently did one on the, four, on the elections, presidents and elections with four other presidential libraries. And then I'm doing one in October uh, with Truman's life through objects. So using artifacts in our museum and they're looking at 10 artifacts um, around Truman's life and then telling the Truman's life story through artifacts. So those are all through the Presidential Primary Sources Project. So you can look for that. And they have a whole series of programs, not just Truman Library from the National Archives in Washington, DC, and then a lot of the other presidential libraries as well contribute to that do them for teachers, for students, for different age groups. Um, we did a three-day class for teachers on president, presidential elections uh, last month. And then we've got one in September, uh, just a one day. It's only 90 minutes, I think, um, on presidential power. So we'll have the Reagan Library talking about who takes over when the president's been shot and we've got the Clinton Library, we've got the Hoover Library, the Carter Library, and then the Truman Library, all part of a one, uh, one session that all look at different elements of presidential power as the theme. So that should be a fascinating one. So Presidential Primary Sources Project, uh, you can search that and find those programs. So, and they've been doing a whole series of those and all of those they've got on their YouTube channel. So if you've missed them, you can go back and look at them as well. Well, that answers my next question. I was going to ask you how closely the other uh, presidential libraries and museums work with you. So it sounds like it's a, it's a close, some overlapping on some of that. Absolutely. Yeah, it is, they really, we work very collaborative together, both with National Archives in Washington, D.C., but then also with uh, the various libraries around the country. So it's a really uh, great collaborative that we have with one another. In normal times, we would invite them and have them present at each physical location. Um, I've presented myself at the Clinton Library and, and the Johnson Library in the past, uh, and they've come to the Truman Library. Right now, we're doing all we can to do everything that, like that virtually. Um, and then one resource we use a lot to do that is a, a website called docsteach.org, run by the National Archives, where they have a repository, not only of primary sources, but all kinds of document analysis tools that you can use online. And that's um, very useful. And all of us also work with National History Day to help students do research for National History Day projects year round as well. Well, great. And you know, that's that's very cool to see just how involved you are with, um, with students and the teachers, um, whether it be spending three days with teachers or doing History Day with the students. Um, and you mentioned YouTube and, and I will um, add that this will be available um, probably in a couple of weeks. We'll put it on our YouTube um, so everybody can access it after um and it won't be locked behind anything it will be free to watch um and i do want to thank you mark so much for taking time tonight to to speak with everybody um to help explore uh the decision to uh, use nuclear weapons um and then truman's life after um so i really am grateful on behalf of the museum uh, our board of trustees thank you so much for for taking the time to spend your evening here Thank you for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure. And I do want to add, 
um, to everybody who's listening. Um, we are going to be having a um, our next uh, featured talk on September 2nd on Victory Japan Day, over Japan Day. Uh, we're going to be featuring um, the Director of Library and Archives, um, Chris McDougall over at the National Museum of the Pacific War. He'll be discussing the Operation Magic Carpet um, or taking the, the soldiers and transporting back to the U.S. So looking at the, the end of the war, but that there was still plenty of work to be done. Um, and we also have our brand new Trinity exhibit, which where we look at the science, the technology, the history of the pro program itself, as we were talking about. Um, so lots of exciting stuff over at the museum. Mark, again, it was a joy to have you. Stay thank safe you. out there. And everybody, thank you so much for, for watching and listening. You all have a wonderful evening. Thank you, guys. Yeah.